two and a half years after I started sending warnings about mortgages. Warnings which went to the top of city and the board of directors. Warnings which no one wanted to hear. Two and a half years later, three bailouts later, $350 billion in capital and asset, toxic asset guarantees later. And the United States government owned 36% of the largest bank in the country. This is something that happens in third world countries. And this started the national dialogue. Are we nationalizing our banks? Now, my story is only one of many stories which came out of the financial crisis. This financial crisis which cost our country 13 trillion dollars. That is $41,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country. So, Alan Stein, have you, uh, have you paid your family share of that yet? <laughs> and through 2006 and 2007, the volumes kept increasing and the rate of defective mortgages increased to in excess of 80%. Now, my boss, the chief underwriter, was very supportive of me. He was equally concerned. He would take my warnings, put his warnings on top of them, and send them on to an even greater distribution list. And then, sometime in 07, he had all of his responsibilities reassigned. And he felt compelled to take early retirement. And my new boss was not real happy about these warnings that I continued to send. So folks, I figured I have a limited amount of time here. But I had to get to the board of directors. I look at it this way, I had one shot, a Hail Mary pass. But how do you structure a warning that the gods in New York will read and heed? I was one of 375,000 employees in the largest corporation in the world. And I was in Irving, Texas. <laughs> I drafted this email. I sent it to Robert Rubin, who the next day was named chairman of the board. I also sent it to the chief auditor, the chief financial officer, the chief risk officer. They all have responsibilities under Sarbanes-Oxley. In the first paragraph, I said, I am not a flake. I am your business chief underwriter. I am a CPA. A. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have put the CPA. <laughs> and then, in the second paragraph, I set the hook. Breakdowns in internal controls. Unrecognized financial losses. And then in the rest of the email, I told the story about how I had started issuing warnings in June of 2006. The volumes had increased. The rate of defective mortgages had increased from 60% to an excess of 80%. And then also in the email, I called for an outside investigation. I said, come in here from the outside and investigate what's going on. Because everybody here already knows <laughs> my 29-page testimony. I say submitted it, I put it in the mail. Now, when they received it the next day, it was as if the whole world had changed. They said, um, 
Yeah, Bowen, uh, yeah, we told you you could have 30 pages of testimony, but we have decided that it is too long. And we will tell you what to take out of your testimony. I said, take out the fact that you testified before the SEC. You gave them 1,000 pages of documents. They were very interested, and then they dropped it. Take it out. Also, take out your concerns about your com the compliance with Sarbanes-Oxley. Take it out. Also, take out your concerns about the truthfulness of representations which were given to investors of mortgage-backed securities. We know we said in the letter to put it in there, but take it out. It's too long. Also take out all of the names and the specific incidents that you had in there. Also take out what happened to you after you wrote the Rubin email. Now folks, this was made very clear to me that this was not optional. As a matter of fact, it was made pretty clear that if I didn't make these edits, I would probably be taken off the witness list. The chairman Angeles called the hearing to order. The very first witness was Alan Greenspan. Now, you can't see me in the photograph, but I am sitting two rows behind Alan Greenspan, directly behind him, just taking all of this in. I mean, folks, I'm from West Texas. This was cool. <laughs> so I'm sitting there. My phone is on vibrate. It's in my coat pocket. And so I'm sitting there watching Greenspan testify, and all of a sudden my phone goes, bzz, bzz. oh, jeez, oh, oh, somebody sent me a text. So I reached in my coat pocket. Well, he pulled it out. And now there's a lesson here, folks. Someone is always watching. You are always on camera. My cousin, who was in Fort Worth, was watching the hearings on C-SPAN, and he texted me, you're on TV! I wanted everybody watching on TV to know that I had sent this email. I had warned Robert Rubin, chairman of the board. I had warned David Bushnell, the chief risk officer for the corporation. I outlined the business practices that I had witnessed and had attempted to address. I specifically warned Mr. Rubin about the extreme risks and unrecognized financial losses that existed within my business unit. When I left Citi, she was demoted, she was stripped of her responsibility and stuck over on the side. And she told me, I am going to take very careful notes, and I'm going to keep copies of documents. And in February of last year, she was still an employee, February of last year, she filed a suit against Citi, charging them with defrauding the United States government by falsely certifying mortgages as eligible for FHA insurance. That very same day, the Department of Justice joined her suit and Citi admitted wrongdoing. This is not one of those that they didn't have to admit. They admitted wrongdoing and paid a $158 million fine. Sherry Hunt received a check for $31 million. She is a wonderful lady. And in the interviews that took place, she said, they didn't make any changes after Bowen sent all of his warnings. They just kept cranking out the mortgages. That's my picture, by the way. <laughs> so, oh, did I mention to you that Cherry Hunt retired? <laughs> I am very concerned. I am really 
concerned about the future of our country. History 101 tells us that the collapse of every great civilization started with the erosion of core values. Erosion of core values. Now you can, you can pick any measure you want to, so let's just pick one. Talk about it. During the 1940s, 20% of college students admitted to cheating in high school. 20%. In the 70s, that number more than doubled to more than 40% admitted cheating in high school. Today, 85 to 90% consistently admit to cheating in high school. And they are, feel justified by doing it because the non-cheaters get lower grades. 60% of them said that it's not a big deal. And they didn't get caught. And they didn't expect to get caught. Erosion of core values. Now, you can say, but these are just high school students. They're still kids. Their values are still being formed. After all, they're learning from us.